Hi, and welcome to another episode of Inertia Creeps. Um, today, I've got my good friend Brian Downs with me. Um, I will give a very brief intro because Brian's career has been quite remarkable up to now. So, I'll, Brian, I'll let you kind of tell us more about it. But basically, adventurer, psychologist, champion of neurodiversity, um, international hockey player. We won't talk about hockey today. Um, and a whole whack of other things. So, Brian, do you want to put a little meat on the bone of your career up to now? Uh, so, I'm a management consultant that looks at performance enablement, um, team development and leadership capability around both. Mm -hmm. uh, I have ADHD, which I found out about four years ago, and I have found that... Congratulations. Yes, thank you very much. I found out <laughs> by accident, by the way. Um, and uh, I have found that a lot of the inherent traits of ADHD are really, really useful in the work I do, but I'd known that for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, and I speak professionally uh, in, mm. in, in all sorts of places, but I started out studying accountancy. Uh, which I hated. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, never I wouldn't have pegged that one. No, no, no. Uh, never worked as an accountant um, and uh, went into corporates for a little while. Uh, so I worked in logistics with two really big companies uh, as a global account manager. Really enjoyed that, but I didn't like being told what to do. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd always wanted to work for myself. So um, I went into business with a few other people in 2005. So I'm nearly 20 years self-employed now mm -hmm. in one form or another. Uh, and we grew a pretty big business. We were involved in, in uh, property development, um, some retail, uh, some hospitality, uh, commodity brokerage, tropical agribusiness. Yeah, we built stuff in West Africa. It sounds massively uh, like an ADHD business. <laughs> yeah, I, I think the people I was involved with would have been uh, undiagnosed ADHD as well. I, I, would, I would say that now. Mm. Um, but uh, yeah, I needed to, to, to leave that business. Um, just for my own well-being, mm -hmm. um, which I did in 2011. Mm -hmm. um, but I'd started studying again and, and looking at coaching and training and behaviours and all this kind of stuff, which I really, really love and always did. Um, and I've been doing this work for yeah nearly 13 years now. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's 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 wonderful. I really, really enjoy it. I, love, I just love people and, and getting in a room with people regardless of kind of where they come from. Mm. Uh, what they do, who they are. Uh, it's it's nice to kind of get under people's skin a bit. Mm. And tell me a little bit about your your ADHD diagnosis and how that how you feel that is influencing your career path now. Um, I always knew it was different now. Mm -hmm. I, my my brain has always worked a little bit. Difference is good. Like. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I was always okay with it. Actually, it never bothered me too much. Yeah. Um, you know, in, in school. Despite being intelligent, I couldn't sit and learn stuff off by heart. I mean, I found it really, really hard. And sport was mm. kind of my outlet for all that excess mm. energy. So my my diagnosis is is moderate severe combined type ADHD. Mm. So moderate on the attention deficit uh, and severe on the uh, hyperactivity piece. Mm. Um, and I also have an anxiety disorder that goes along with that, which mm. is pretty common with ADHD people. Um, so, so sport was an outlet for me. It, it still is to this day. I'm, I mean, I'm I'm 50 now, uh, and and it, my whole life has been good for it. Thanks, man. <laughs> uh, and, and you know, I've been involved in sport my whole life mm. uh, in in various ways. So, so with school, yeah, I couldn't sit and learn stuff off by heart. I, well, I could, but it took me an awful long time. Mm. I was really good at problem solving. Really good at logical thinking and reasoning things out and connecting dots. Mm. Um, I was good at maths and, and, and economics, things like that. Um, and I, obviously I didn't know I had ADHD at that stage. Um, but I started to use that kind of unconsciously, I suppose, in mm. a way. Uh, and, and over time, and it took me a little, a little time, uh, I started to focus on that more and more and more. So a lot of my work now is connecting those dots through conversations with people. It is problem solving. It is looking at things from a different perspective and trying to find mm. other ways to approach uh, growing a business, develop a leader, develop a team. You know, looking. You know, I can spot the dynamics within a group of people mm -hmm. again, just sitting in conversation with them. I don't know how, mm -hmm. right? And and this is kind of an ADHD thing, right? It, you know, I I can just see it, and and it's not that I'll jump in and kind of say, okay we need to sort this out or this out, it's asking more questions and helping people, mm -hmm. kind of taking that coaching approach and helping people <clears throat> get to that point themselves where they can see it themselves. Um, but I love that I have ADHD. I, I genuinely do. Mm. Uh, it's got its downsides, for sure. Mm. Um, but life has its downsides. 
right yeah you know it, it, it and it, and and like the like for me and it's interesting you're talking there because my experience of it is very similar but we actually have kind of almost the opposite experience with it that i'm not high on the hyperactivity side but very high on the attention side mm. and i was much more interested in english mm. and i was much better at articulating my way around a problem um and maths and stuff like that for it's not that i couldn't do them it's just i didn't they didn't interest me mm. and that's something where i i remember in school um i remember having a priest um call me a particularly unpleasant name one day because uh, and and this is like hilarious like this was in fifth year or sixth year or something but the priest who was our maths teacher said to me um yeah after calling me the name he goes you know you're going to get your a but you're stopping because i was messing about mm. he says you're stopping the other guys in the class from learning and to, and 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 the thing that struck me was like first of all i had no intention of stopping anyone else from learning and i would have felt bad about that but it was more the do you mean I'm going to get an A? Like, where did you pluck that from? <laughs> it's news to me in my life. Like, but the thing for me was, my experience with it was that I could retain stuff. And mm. I have this ridiculous brain and it drives, and, and Shem, our producer here, producer Shem, as she's known, um, kind of constantly rolls her eyes because I'm always, I have a quote for every occasion. I remember song lyrics or I remember movie lines. The stuff just registers in my brain and stays there. Mm. But I can't do an exam. And I'm actually, it, it's really interesting in adult life, I found it really hard to do interviews. Mm -hmm. If I'm doing a casual chat with somebody about a job, I can absolutely blow them away. And I'll, I know mm. I'm, I'm, I, I have them in the palm of my hand. As soon as I go into a structured interview and I'm thinking about what they're looking for, I'm going off on tangents around how do I answer this question for them mm -hmm. rather than just relaxing and answering the bloody question. So it's, it's, I guess what, where I'm going with this is that it's fascinating to me when we talk about neurodiversity, and there is a certain jaundice view nowadays about, oh, Jesus, everybody's got ADHD, or everybody's got this, or everybody's got that. And I kind of take the view of, so what? So what if everyone has some form of diagnosis? And my, my kind of view of the world, and where I'm looking at, and this is where I want to talk to you about leadership, is if we were to look at leadership from the point of view of every leader is different. So this idea when we do leadership training of here are the traits of a great leader, which suggests that a great leader is a specific type of person, when actually the reality is some great leaders can be really poor communicators, but are very straight, straight down the line. And you know when they say what they, they, they say what they do and they do what they say. Then you've got other people who are just really great people, per, um, persons who know how to get somebody to come on a journey with them by kind of making them feel good about themselves and building relationships two very different skill sets mm -hmm. the label that each of those people have like one could be autistic one could be adhd one might have neurotypical you know whatever that means um and and the whole thing with neurodiversity is like the, the very definition of being neurodiverse is to be outside the norm it's been outside the average and i take a very simple view in life that i never consult the average for any question because i think the average person is a moron but that's you know <laughs> not necessarily a great thing to say when you're running a podcast show but from your perspective if you're going to celebrate difference if we're going to acknowledge that different is good and as leaders we have a challenge to to take people on a journey how do you create this environment where the difference in your team get an opportunity to thrive does that make sense yeah, well, look, first thing I'd say about leadership is uh, it's almost horses for courses, right? So not every team requires the same kind of leadership. And I, I'll refer back to, uh, I'm sure you've come across Daniel Goleman's six leadership yeah. styles and, yeah. and, and that. And that this idea of situation leadership and being able to adapt to the situation and the people that you have around you. So I think that's really, really important. Mm -hmm. um, when you're when you're managing a team, a group of people, it is important that you're conscious that everybody's heard, right? Because we want people to feel like they belong to something. Mm. You know, I think, think that's really important. Performance comes from, you know, trust and engagement first. Uh, and you've got to do your best to engage people, to bring them into the conversation, to get, uh, to get them to, to offer their opinion, to bring their ideas to the table, to say, actually, it's worth the risk, mm. right? Um, and I don't think there's one kind of 
kind of environment that does that. It's it's very dependent on the organisation. It's very dependent on the makeup of that team, the type of people in that team, the type of leader that you are, the type of problems that you're grappling with. Um, you know, the, the, all of those things matter. But but at its core, we've got to engage people, and we've got to we've got to if we're going to lead people, we've got to trust them first, mm -hmm. so that they can trust us. Yeah. Right. Uh, so. And and the, the trust thing is really really important. Actually, I don't think it. I don't think leaders uh, are intentional enough about it. Mm -hmm. Right. There's, there's, at times, I get I get a feeling from people from people in leadership positions that, oh well, they should trust me and they should trust the company. I said no, no, mm. that's not how people work. Mm. You know, some people trust trust slowly. You've got to earn it. So you've got to show them that you trust them first. Mm. Invite them in. Mm -hmm. And, and, and keep inviting them in. And it's not grand gestures. It's really simple things. The best way to be trusted is to be trustworthy. Yeah. Do what you say you're going to do. Don't make promises you can't keep. Um, and, and engagement will follow from that. And, and then, then we can start to see uh, people getting involved and, and, and being heard and, and offering up their ideas. And remember, you know, for some people, offering up their ideas, something that's that's created by them, mm. that's scary. Mm -hmm. and can be really scary for some people. Mm. Right? For somebody like me, it's actually quite easy. And I can take that for granted sometimes. Uh, but for some people, that's, it's a really big challenge mm -hmm. to say, okay, in front of other people, here's my idea. Here's my thought. Here's what I've been thinking about around this problem. Please don't reject me. Mm. Please don't reject my idea. Right? And you've got to treat that with a lot of respect and care and, you know, tease it out. Mm -hmm. um, but lots of people seem to be in a rush and, and don't take the time to do that. Mm -hmm. And I think if you take the, the time to do that up front, that extra five, ten minutes, that's going to pay huge dividends further down the road. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're, if you're rushing over that at the start, you're never going to reap those dividends. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's a small investment, really. Mm -hmm. It's a really interesting one, actually, because I had this conversation yesterday um, with a, a, a construction industry company, and the issue was around the, the unwillingness for leaders to give feedback. Mm. And, and I was kind of saying that, you know, feedback, you know, the, I, I've referenced it before, um, as I do on these shows probably all the time, but um, John Amici, the, the, the organizational psychologist and former basketball player and absolute genius, a fabulous man to listen to speak, but he talked about people, com, or corporate organizations not being comfortable giving feedback because it was emotionally expensive, mm. which I think is a beautiful term. Mm. But the issue that I find fascinating is that the focus is on, yes, like there's, there's a body of work to be done on how to give feedback, but you have no business giving feedback if you haven't got trust. Yeah. So there's a step before the feedback absolutely and and Paul Zach and, and I know I've talked to you about it before but Paul Zach does a mountain of work around the idea of measuring trust in organizations it's fascinating like from a neuroscience point of view to see how you can measure engagement and trust um and how you can like with with, with the, the, the with the growth of AI now and, and and I'm fascinated by AI I'm doing loads of research into it at the moment but the idea of using AI to predict kind of the the direction that team relationships can go mm -hmm. just by using um there's a thing in ai called nlp and it's not the neural language programming stuff that we we, we talk about in psychology but it's um it's natural language perception i think it is i could be wrong on that but basically what it is is that it the ai tool will take the tone and the sentiment that's coming from people in their feedback in their surveys and whatever and then give you a prediction of where the relationship or the trust or the performance of that team is going to go. Mm. It's fascinating. Yeah. And it's eerily accurate. And, and it really, it comes down to the fact that we all, even though we're all different and even though we all, um, you know, learn in different ways or channel information in different ways, at our core, we all basically want to trust someone. We want to know that I'm in an environment. I mean, nobody wants to go into an office and work with somebody where they're saying one thing to your face and then when they go out for coffee, they're saying something completely different about you. It's mm. nice to be in an environment where you just get all my people and everybody's saying what, you know, I, I live in that, that example. With you and the work you're doing, um, 
when you have a, when you have a view of the world and you're going into organizations and you know and i know from like you know we both do very similar work and we we've had the pleasure to work together on things um how do you maintain enthusiasm um when you walk into an organization and you know it's fundamentally broken but you can sense that the leaders really they're just taking a box they're just looking to do something to to say they did something i'll spend some time trying to take the tick box away and ultimately if it's going to be a tick box scenario i'll say goodbye i've no interest yeah i i have absolutely zero interest in working with people who just want to tick a box mm. there's no satisfaction in that for me whatsoever mm. you know it's it's apathetic mm -hmm. it's um yeah it it, uh, it makes no sense to me mm. because there's no real change going to come from it i i do the work i do because i like to help create change mm. i like to help businesses grow i like to help people grow teams grow and if we're taking a box that's just not going to happen yeah because no matter what i say um nothing's going to change mm -hmm. they're going to keep doing things the way they've always done them and, and what's the point there's plenty of other companies who aren't taking a box so mm -hmm. i focus on them um I, i'm not going to waste my time Really do you annoying. do you spend much time in the kind of the the measuring of impact of the work you do? Uh, formal measuring, no, mm. no. It I I'll see it. I'll hear about it. I'll talk yeah. to people. I'll get I I'll, I'll get the feedback. I'll talk to the leadership people about the teams that I will have worked. Well, I mean, and anecdotal I, evidence is and, still evidence, and I get the, <laughs> I get the feedback. They're performing better. We're seeing we're seeing X Y Z. Yeah, uh, you know, there's more ideas coming to the table. That's what it's about for me, mm. right? Uh, that will lead to bottom line. Mm. It will. It will lead to happier staff. It'll lead to better attention. It'll lead to more engaged uh, people in the in the workplace. Um, all sorts of positives. But um, yeah, I, I I don't do the measuring. I'll I'll just mm. talk to people. You know, HR departments and 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 leaders themselves will do that, and, mm. and I'll get the feedback. And uh, if it's not making a difference, they don't bring me back. Yeah, <laughs> logical. It's that simple. Really. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about like. I just touched on at the start about adventuring and obviously the, you know, I always struggle with, like I've, I've hosted a load of conversations with people who have done remarkable things. Mm. And, you know, I had great pleasure to spend a lot of time with Damien Brown. Oh, before amazing you. individual. Oh, I mean, oh. like an like a, a incredibly strong mm. individual um, on one level. Um, but... I always struggled when I see people talk about climbing Mount Everest or rowing across the Atlantic or something, and, and I'm not including Damien in this, by the way, but I always struggle with people who kind of, they give this air of, well, anyone can do this. No, they can't. And, you know, well, I mean, I couldn't. I couldn't climb a mountain because I don't want to. And I, um, you know, I, I, I've spent most of my career working with athletes talking about being comfortable or get comfortable being uncomfortable. I don't like being uncomfortable. I like a comfy bed. <laughs> no. Well, I, I think you've got to and be that's my thing. You've got to be intentional about your flavor of discomfort. Exactly, right? exactly right. That's a great phrase, actually. Intentional about your flavor of discomfort. But tell me a little bit about because obviously, the the hyperactive side of the way your brain works obviously would be a motivation. Maybe, or am I wrong in thinking? Oh, you, that's yeah. what drives you to do these. things? It's the novelty. Aspect. Tell me a little bit about. What it, why it is you do it, what you get from it, and kind of, and and what um, what value it brings to you, I suppose, after the fact. Because I often feel like s people who go and do these big adventures, um, sometimes they're they're escaping from something, and then they come back to reality, and reality is really mm. difficult to deal with. Is that has that been your experience, or how do how do you kind I've, of work I've, it all together? I've adventure every day. Yeah, uh, I try and bring this adventurous mindset to teams and to people and kind of say yes okay be a little adventurous think about something you know doing it in a different way or mm -hmm. yeah trust yourself throw that idea out there and you know this idea that adventurers are just kind of uh, uh, flahulik or willy nilly and just take off mm. is not true you know mm. adventure is actually quite well managed mm -hmm. you know it, it's it's not a it's not a whim thing um, but let me just go back a bit. So, so when I was a kid, my, my dad was in the scouts, mm -hmm. right? the lifeline scout, uh, and he loved the mountains. And when I was 11, um, he said, uh, do you want to come to the mountains with me? This was, this was in this, uh, 
when I was 11, summer of 1985, my sister had been born in June. June, July were really, really wet, so I didn't get out much. Uh, August brightened up, so Dad said, do you want to go to the mountains? Like, yeah, let's go. I've been stuck in, in, indoors with the screaming sister for two months. It's about time I got out. <laughs> um, but I didn't know we were, we were going to climb Karen Tool, which is Ireland's highest mountain. And to me, at that stage, at 11, you know, that was like Everest. And, mm. you, you know, standing at, at, at the bottom of Hags Glen, looking up at this beautiful mountain on a, on a, a sunny summer's day. Incredible. And we took off. and We, we had a great time. Right? Really, really loved it. But Dad let me lead. He, he kind of nudged me to lead. So there's mm. a section called the Devil's Adder, which is quite steep. It's a, it's a rock fall. Mm. Um, and, and he let me lead up that and pick the, pick the path and, and encourage me the whole way. And I think he, he gave me this gift of an adventurous spirit, mm-hmm. right? I don't know whether he knew he was doing it or not, mm-hmm. but it fit perfectly with the way my brain worked. Mm-hmm. You know, th- this idea of novelty and, 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 uh, and, and getting out there and experiencing new things and, and trying stuff that I hadn't tried before. And it stayed with, with me my whole life. And I've been, look, really fortunate. I've gotten to do some really cool things and, and climb Killy and cross the frozen lake in Outer Mongolia and, mm-hmm. you know, spent a lot of time in West Africa and, all really interesting stuff, but all driven by my my need for adventure, almost. You know, just to get out there and see what's there, mm-hmm. right? Uh, but again, these were well planned. It wasn't just on a whim. Um, so I think I try to bring that every day. I go to yeah. work, right? I try and I try and impart that to people to see if I can draw them into to taking a risk mm. where, where they might not have taken a risk before uh, to, to, as I said, throw that idea on the table, um, you know, give that bit of feedback, have that difficult conversation. Mm. We need to have more, more difficult conversations because uh, that's a really useful trust building exercise to engage in that conflict because we need to get that conflict done. Mm. Do it now or let it grow and fester and do it in six months yeah. when it explodes. Things like that. Mm. Um, but I found it incredibly useful. Add to that, that I think traveling is probably one of the greatest educations anybody can ever have. Experiencing cultures all over the world. You know, I've, I've been to lots and lots of places and experienced lots and lots of different cultures, met some amazing people. It's an incredible education. Mm-hmm. Um, and I will encourage people to, to do that. But start small, mm. right? Take baby steps. You don't have to go straight into running a metaphorical ultra marathon. Mm. Ease into it, um, and and that's what I try to get people to do. And it's interesting actually because as you're talking there, I'm realizing I've actually lived my life at a very adventurous spirit. I wouldn't but doubt just, it, but not not to the point of putting my body through abject pain. <laughs> but, but you see, but this is, this is most most people's idea of what adventure is. Yeah. right? I quite enjoy the pain. I've, I've run ultra distances and, and all of that and, and, and for various reasons I enjoyed the pain of training and, and doing that right that's fine uh, but most people's idea of adventure is doing things like that it, mm. it, it is climbing big mountains and going to far flung places actually you can you can have adventure in your every day mm. I mean adventure is, is, is trying something different thinking it through and saying okay I'm going I'm to try this and committing to it mm. um, and, and I, yeah I, I don't doubt that you've experienced it a lot yeah, no, and it, it's just, it's fascinating because I, I've always, I suppose I was being a touch facetious when I said I've kind of, I'm not comfortable being uncomfortable because I have, I mean, I've lived mm-hmm. in a bunch of different countries and I've, like, I left an incredibly secure job in, 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 in the police that was like guaranteed pension, nearly finished my poor mother off and I told her, <laughs> even, and telling her I was going to have to do sports psychology in Canada, I was like, a, what the hell is sports psychology, and B, why is it in Canada? Well, so, there's a seriously big adventure, right? Yeah, and and but but I've always see I, I see it. I, I'm I'm fascinated by it, but I see it from a different lens because I I, mean, I think it was George Bernard Shaw who said, "Most see the world as it is and ask why, and I see what's never been and ask why not." Mm. And that's kind of where my brain goes to the excitement of this has never been done before. What if it was like this? Or nobody's talking about this. Why don't we look at it this way? That's kind of where my brain goes to. Yeah. Whereas your brain goes to, I need to put my body through abject misery. And I love that. <laughs> it does <laughs> and, a bit of both, right? But because yeah, obviously yeah. now taking that into, into, into a boardroom or a meeting room, it's, okay, let's look at this yeah. in a different way. Uh, it's, the, it's the same thing, Noel. Mm. You know, yeah. it's essentially the same thing. Yeah. Um, 
and I think it's really important. I look, I, I I'm biased, obviously, uh, but for me, I get so much joy and excitement mm. and 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 pleasure from it. I don't know any other way. Mm. When you did something, you know, like you know, climbing Kilimanjaro or, or the, the running across the ice lakes, the the the, the, the in Mongolia, in Mongolia, yeah. yeah, which sound and I've seen the photographs actually, absolutely incredible, possibly the most spectacular. Place I love the idea been. of being there to take the photograph and watch you run. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but but when you get to the end of something like that, and obviously there is a physical toll that something like that takes, right? But but mentally and emotionally, what is your takeaway? from completing something like that and succeeding and get you know having that experience like what what is it that you walk away afterwards and not necessarily straight away but in the days weeks months afterwards what is it that you get from that that makes it kind of because what i found fascinating about damien when i was talking to him was that he was finishing his five Sahara Desert Marathon thing and, and while he was doing that he was planning his Atlantic Row mm. and while he's finishing his Atlantic Row he's planning something else and and I, I, and I actually asked him at one stage I said well what are you running away from because like he's got a you know a wife and young kid at home mm. and that's his life and that's and that's their family and, and you know everybody discovers their own path in life but I was fascinated by that like that you're thinking about the next thing um, and what I'm wondering is, is there a moment where you finish something like that and there's just that sense of, you know, I've learned something new about myself today and or I've learned something new about the world or I've, I've learned something that I'm going to bring into mm. my work that's going to be different. First thing, and it's probably the most important thing for me, is I get, I get to be awestruck. Yeah. I, I, you've seen some of the pictures from, I from have. Mongolia. Stunning. I, I, pure awe. I mean, coming down off Kilimanjaro uh, on summit day, we camp, I think it's three and a half thousand meters. Uh, and that evening, we saw a thunderstorm from above the clouds. Wow. You know what I mean? Yeah. And wake up the next morning to see the top of the mountain covered in, in, in snow. It, it's just experience. Mm. There's not a single thing that comes from all of them. Mm. Um, there's lots of things that come from all of them. And they're, you know, they can be different. They can be little things. Um, you know, I mean, in, in, in Mongolia, it was minus 40 degrees at nighttime. Mm. You know, I got to feel what that was like. I'd never felt that before. Mm. Uh, and find that, actually, yeah, I can survive this. This, this is fine. Mm. Yeah. It, it, it was actually quite comfortable uh, and enjoyable. Oh, no, let's take it. Uh, genuinely, <laughs> I, I mean, you know, we, we, we had a campfire every night. And, yeah. you know, you drink a beer, you have dinner. Um, and and then go back to a TP that was literally some sticks put together in a sheet wrapped around it, uh, and climb into a sleeping bag, um, mm. and sleep the best sleep. You know, obviously you're tired after a mm. long day. Um, I think, yeah, awest- being, being awestruck is is the one thing that's common to all of them, mm. uh, and I don't think there's enough of that in the world. Allowing ourselves to be awestruck. I agree. Yeah. Right. Uh, but. You know, I'm, I've been awestruck on the top of Karen Tool on a beautiful day. Mm. Um, I've been awestruck by the birth of my daughter, mm. who's seven and a half now. I mm. mean, completely awestruck. Mm-hmm. Uh, you've just got to be looking for it. And doing things like that, I suppose, help me, helps me see it more often. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm awestruck quite a bit, which is nice. So if you were to take that kind of mindset of awestruck, which I love, and I am awestruck every day by the smallest little things um, and I think it's a lovely way to live your life to yeah, look is, for the yeah. beauty um, somebody somebody in my life a little while back used to give out to me because I was walking around my head down mm. and I'd be off in my own little world and my own little thoughts and and they said to me it's a beautiful day sun is shining get your head up enjoy life mm. and I realized that even though I wasn't consciously trying to avoid or not look or you know be miserable that's exactly what I was doing. So I've tried to made a conscious effort to try and lift my head and just find something. And I got really interested in this whole concept of mindful walking and just like going out for a walk, but actually experiencing what's going on around you. Mm. And I love your reference to experiences. Um, but with all of that and how that shapes your work, what would you say is the, the single biggest challenge uh, and maybe this, the single biggest sense of, of, 
awe that you get from the work you do and from what you see with the people you work with and the thing that makes you turn up again the next day. The things that keep me coming back are the challenges, right? Yeah. Uh, to put it under one umbrella, the biggest challenge are people. People will be people, right? They're different. They have different experiences. Um, they look at the world in different ways. It might be a small difference, but it's still a difference. Mm. And, and trying to bring that together into a cohesive unit of a team that are uh, aligned and, and looking to achieve something specific, right? So, so helping them come together, understand that, yes, we're all different, understand that we can communicate, we can argue. It's actually okay to argue, and I love that one. It's okay to argue. Mm -hmm. Just do it right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay? yeah. Okay. Build some rules around it. Mm. How are we going to engage when we when we've got to argue? Argue arguing it can, it can kind of fall into two um uh come from two things, right? Mm. It it can come from one uh, one side being I just don't like this other person mm -hmm. and that's not very healthy. Or it can come from another side with actually I've got an I've got a competing idea here and I'm really passionate about it. Mm -hmm. Well, then you should both be heard. Mm -hmm. have the have the argument have the debate um and and that's what keeps me coming back i love that i mm. love to get involved in that and help people navigate that mm -hmm. because look when you start to do that and and you know i'll talk I'll talk about let's move towards conflict here mm. i'll often get the mm, we don't we don't do conflict yes you do yes you do you can do this we're just going to do it right let's develop some rules um, and let's get into some meaningful conversations and let's have the, let's have the row. It's, it's perfectly okay. Mm -hmm. What's not okay is to scream and roar at each other and, uh, you know, make it personal and you know, let's argue about the idea. How about that? Mm. Yeah, you've brought that idea and you brought that idea. Let's talk about that idea. I don't care that you're that type of person, you're that type of person. That's irrelevant. We've got two ideas in the table here and they could both be really great. Let's debate them. Let's have that argument. That's meaningful, right? Here's the problem we're trying to solve. Will either of these ideas move us beyond that problem? Yes, okay. Which one's gonna do it better, quicker, more effectively, more efficiently, whatever it is. Um, that's a lot of fun, Niall. That's a lot of fun. I love that. That's a great message to finish on. Um, and I suppose we can have our little conversation about conflict off air, but- uh, Yeah, yeah. But I think, yeah, and I mean, I would, re I, would, I would recommend and I would encourage people to get in touch with Brian if they're looking to do something a little bit different with their teams and to understand the individuals within their teams and their struggles and bring a little bit of all back into the world. Absolutely. So. Why not? It's fun. It, it, puts is fun. It, it puts a smile on people's face. And this half hour has put a smile on mine. Thanks, man. Mine I really appreciate your time. Thanks, man. So that concludes season one of Inertia Creeps with me, Nilo Carl. Thanks so much for tuning in and we'll see you shortly for season two. <laughs>